good morning. This isn't where I wanted to be. <laughs> as great as this is, of being in the chapel and doing a, a live stream service, I wanted to stand in a smoky parking lot today. Standing on a stage where I could see you sitting in your car and just trust that those cars were going to be filled with people who really deeply wanted to meet together. Even though, are, are we together if we're really in cars? I mean, whatever. It's better than what we have right now, right? But I didn't want to do this, but this is what we got. Because of the fires around us and the just technical difficulties we've had, this is, this is what we got, right? We had to push back our, our service until, uh, our drive-in service until September 11th, and we will, we will gather, but I understand this. Some of you are disappointed. I mean, I get the fact that some of you just, you're desperate to meet together with people. And uh, I know why it's hard, because I've read your emails. <laughs> I've heard conversations that you've had with people. And part of it's gone like this. You just haven't seen anybody in so long. You haven't seen anybody from church in a really long time. And the friendships that you do have, some of them got blown up this season. Maybe you posted something online and your friendship circle, they gave you a hard time about that and your friendships have blown up. For others of you, I've heard your story that when you first came to our church, you had some things going on in your life. You had some issues. You had some habits that you were leaving behind. You had some problems and maybe some people you were trying to leave behind. But in this season, your support system got stripped away and those issues and those habits and some of those people have come back into your life. And it's left you feeling desperate and wondering, God, where are you? I want you to hear this. There is nothing stopping you from meeting with other Christians. The, the church is not closed. So let me ask you this question. Whose number's in your phone? Whose number is in your phone who's a, a follower of Jesus Christ or goes to this church? Who do you have connection to? Because... This is the reason we have community groups. If you don't have a single number in your phone from someone from our church, you have to be new. You have to be new to our church because of this. We spend so much time and energy encouraging you, uh, pleading with you, get connected to people. Don't be a stranger at this church. Our community group season is designed for you to get to know people, do life together, be known by them, and be encouraged by them. We're going to start a brand new season on September 13th. But listen, don't wait until then. Here's what you can do. If you are desperate to meet with people, just email us. Email us and we will get you connected to someone. If you're not new to this church and you still don't have a phone number in your phone from anybody at this church, let's do two things. First, you can email us today. We are happy to meet with you and connect you with people, okay? The second is this. Let's change what it means to do church. Let's do it differently. When we relaunch our community group season, when we relaunch our gathering together, let's, let's do it differently. Don't avoid groups. Don't be too busy for it. This isolation season has proven to us how essential relationships are. So I just wanted to give us this reminder. For those of you who are saying, man, I just really want to regather. We didn't this week and you're disappointed. Um, just first of all, the church isn't closed and there are Christians who are happy to meet with you. So if people are willing and able to meet with each other and encourage each other, here's the question. What in fact are we missing? I mean, what is it the thing that we're begging to regather for? What if what we're actually feeling and saying is, we just want to return to the way it used to be. Think about that for a minute. What was the way it used to be? If what you mean by, I want to return to the way it used to be, means this. That you rolled up to the church after the first two songs. Come on, I'm just being straight with you, right? Some of y'all roll up after the first two songs. You, you show up and you listen to a message and your engagement with, with the message to, to some extent is whether you liked it or not, and it ends there. And then you walk through the lobby and you do, hey, how you doing? You good? I'm good. Okay. See you next week. And then you walk to the parking lot and you drive away feeling pretty good about yourself. If that's what you are looking to return to, I want to invite you to do it differently. I, I know, I know. I was just being a little bit critical um, 
maybe a little comically so, okay? I'm just saying this, if you're not connected to people who you can know and they can know you and encourage you, let's not return to how we used to do church. Let's return to a truly united, connected group of Jesus followers who deeply encourage each other. So this morning, here's what I want to do. I want to speak to our relationships, how we see each other, how we treat each other. And, and here's why. This is, this is critical, and uh, it's because our world's on fire. <laughs> Look out your window, wherever you're sitting. Look out your window right now. If you're in the Bay Area, you know this. Our world's on fire. The SCU complex fire. I mean, it's one of the largest fires ever in California. 375,000 acres have burned. Off to the east right now. We, we can see the smoke. To our west, 84,000 acres have burned in the CZU complex fire. There's been almost 100,000 people who've been displaced. Many of you have donated to help them. Some of you have, been st have people staying with you right now. They evacuated and came to your house. By the way, fantastic way to go. If you don't know this, because you're not from around here, these fires were started by lightning. But before the lightning ever came, our world was on fire. Our world's been on fire politically for I don't know how long. In terms of social justice, racism, tension, our world is on fire. Our relationships are on fire. Our lack of ability to listen. Our world is on fire because we created this thing that is now termed the cancel culture. If I say something you don't like, we can't be friends, and you cancel that person from your life. And sometimes people go beyond that. Instead of canceling that person, we look to destroy each other. The level of violence against one another right now, our world's on fire. And the truth is this, I believe it leaves everyone discouraged. I mean, you might feel like you're on the outside of this, like you don't have any haters coming at you. You feel like you are on the outside of the political system, even though it's your country. Whether you feel on the outside of all of it or not, it can absolutely leave you feeling discouraged. And so last week I just started talking to the discouraged church. So if you're discouraged this season, I'm speaking directly to you. Last week we talked about what got Peter out of his discouragement and launched him into ministry. It was Jesus' reminder about how much he was loved. Loved so much that despite how much Peter messed up, Jesus invited him back into ministry. This week, I want to talk about the discouragement that's specifically in our relationships with one another. So here's the question. How do we quench the fire that's ruining our relationships? Now, th this could be a, a discussion from just friend to friend, right? This could be a discussion, though, th that is pertinent to parenting our kids or kids, your relationship with your parents. Or it could be talking about marriages. This could, though, be also a talk towards our relationships, towards people that are of a different race than us. I'm going to be straight. What I'm about to say, this in no way encompasses a solution to the racism and the violence that we are experiencing in our country right now. But this is absolutely foundational to fixing that problem. Many people are asking this question, what's the new way forward? In this world that is just on fire. What is the new way forward to fixing relationships? And I, I'm going to tell you this. It's not actually a new way forward. It's about an ancient path that has always been there. And it's called the gospel. The gospel is the answer to our relationships. I know that that might be, um, sound to like some of you like I'm over-promising. But let me explain it this way. There's plenty of examples in the New Testament about churches that struggled in their relationships. And we're going to look at one, uh, the church in Galatia. Um, if you have a Bible, just open to the book of Galatians. I'm going to be all over the place in Galatians. And I would suggest this. Maybe just go online right now and just download the notes from this. And I, I would highly encourage you this week, because I'm not going to have time, I'm going to have to double time it through the, the scriptures and walk you through a lot of Galatians. I would so encourage you, grab the notes this week. Read through them and ask yourself a series of questions. I wrote reflection questions in these notes. Here's the problem in the church. This is how Paul describes it. Galatians 5.15, he says this. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. 
th- th- this is the church. This isn't the world he's talking about. He's talking about God's people. When they gather together, you're biting each other. You're devouring each other. And if you're not careful and you don't watch out, you will destroy each other. Here's how they relationally messed up. If you have Galatians, open your Bible, go to chapter 2. Here's what it says, chapter 2, verse 11. This is the storyline, something that was happening that Paul refers to. He says this, when Cephas, and he's referring to Peter, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Now listen, apparently Peter did something dumb. He did something wrong. Did he totally know it was wrong? Did he do it by mistake? What we know is this, is Paul is telling us he was totally guilty. He did something wrong. And then he goes on to explain verse 12. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. A church, united as one, people who formerly hated each other, Jews and Gentiles. The Jews would refer to the Gentiles as dogs. Not like, hey dog, what's up? I mean, (laughs) not like that. Or even like, you're a cute little dog. Like, oh, it's like my puppy. No, no, no. Dogs in that day were like oversized rodents, right? Not that they looked any different. They had a totally different value back then than they do today. It would say, you dirty, oversized rodent. That's what I think of you and all of your people. That's a pretty significant line between two ethnic groups. But Peter and and the church that he got to be a part of, when they all gathered for a meal together, there was a Jew sitting here and then a Gentile and then a Jew and then a Gentile and a Jew and a Gentile. And Peter was mixing it up with everyone. When Peter came to Antioch, I posed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, and you have to understand this, James is this pillar of the church down in Jerusalem. And All of the the people that surrounded him were these Jews, pillars in the church. Then it says this, but when they, the Jewish leaders from Jerusalem, arrived, he began, Peter began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid. He didn't back away from them because he had this tremendous conviction that he was going to do the right thing. He was actually just fearful of what someone else thought of him. Peer pressure drove Peter to do the wrong thing. He was afraid, verse 12, of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy. Don't miss this, don't miss this. Jew, Gentile, Jew, Gentile, Jew, Gentile. Peter backs away, and so do all the other Jews. They were just following their leader's example. So that by their hypocrisy, verse 13, even Barnabas was led astray. You know Barnabas, right? You know what his name means, the son of encouragement. He's the guy that everybody loves <laughs> because he loves everybody. He's got this gift for encouraging people. He, he strikes me as that person that people are just drawn to. And even that guy stepped away from the Gentiles because of Peter's example. Could you imagine what the Gentiles felt in that moment in that church? <laughs> Yeah, a lot of progress we've made with the gospel. Yeah, you Jews, you you speak a good game that, yeah, we're all one, but look at what you're doing. We actually haven't made any progress at all. You say that we're one. You say that we're equals. You claim that we're all in God's family. But your Jewish friends show up. You're afraid of what might they think, and now you pull away from us? Paul, we're not sure how. He knew that all of this was happening in a church, and he handled it. Like Jesus instructed him. He he didn't just text him. He didn't talk about him to other people. Uh, Paul didn't put a meme online about him. He didn't go to the press. He showed integrity, strength, and character. He went directly to Peter's face. He handled it like a man. No offense, women. Like It's just a saying, right? He handled it with courage. And he called out Peter. Peter, you're burning your relationships. Peter, you're discouraging the church. But I I want you to see what Paul says in the problem. He doesn't say that Peter was unkind or mean or hypocritical. He makes it really clear what Peter's problem is. Listen to this, verse 14. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. That's the problem. 
Peter's actions were this. You, you don't understand what the gospel is, Peter. <laughs> he said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs. What he was saying is this. All of a sudden, you're living like this Gentile, like everybody is one, and the things that used to divide us no longer divide us. Now, you're going to tell these Gentile people, unless you act like a Jew, by the way, the issue in the church was circumcision, all right, but we don't have to get into all that today. You're trying to force them now to become more like you and be Jewish instead of allowing those lines to be erased so that you could all be one in following Jesus. Peter, you're setting your relationships on fire. You're hurting people. You're dividing the church by ethnic lines that should not exist. And here's the problem, Peter, ready? You don't understand the gospel. The gospel's the answer. That ancient path is the answer to our relationships. Stop, listen. Paul said that to Peter. Peter knew Jesus better than Paul. Peter was one of the original guys. How can Peter not know the gospel? And what do you mean by the gospel? I mean, to you, some, some of you might be thinking, the gospel. Oh, I, I believe in the gospel, right? I prayed to be forgiven by Jesus, and I joined his family. Well, what does my forgiveness have to do with relationship conflict? Listen to this. Like Peter, our understanding of the gospel, it needs to grow up. It needs to mature so that we can live out the gospel. Now, the gospel means good news, okay? That, that's what the term means. And in the letter to the Galatian church, this good news is the answer to the church's problem. Don't miss this. The word gospel, it shows up 11 times in the book of Galatians. In the first chapter, it shows up five times. In chapter two, it shows up four times. And then in chapter three and four, it shows up one time each. That word keeps showing up because it's the answer to the church's conflict. All right, listen, I'm going to have to double my pace here because I, I know this, that we have a lot to go through. So this week, again, download those notes, go through those questions. Here's the question. What does a mature view of the gospel entail? And how does it quench the destruction in our relationships? I'm going to go through this quickly. So here it is. The gospel means this. We're all equals at the cross. There's level ground at the cross. There's no higher ground or lower ground. We don't stand above each other or below each other. There's equal ground at the cross. Chapter 2, verse 6. As for those who were held in high esteem, he's talking about the Jews who were there, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. Paul was trying to defend himself like, I don't care whether the Gentiles accept me or the Jews accept me. He's saying, God doesn't show favoritism. So why would, why would we? Hear this. When Christians look down on another ethnic group of people, when Christians avoid a certain group of people, it's often based on what the Jewish Christians thought, that God looked down on them, that God actually favored their group over another group. But Paul states this. God doesn't play favorites among his family of followers. And then in verse 17, he says this. He writes directly to his Christian friends who are Jewish. He says, but if in seeking to be justified in Christ, standing at the foot of the cross, justified, pronounced innocent, forgiven, we Jews, we also find ourselves among the sinners. Doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. Here's the point. When we became a Christian, when you accepted the forgiveness that Jesus offered, you first had to admit that you came to the cross of Christ where Jesus died. You came as a, as a sinner. There's an equality at the cross. The ground at the cross is level for everyone. We're admitting we're imperfect. We have regrets for our sins. We're sorry because we've dishonored God with our lives. There's no place for us to look down on others because we're simply looking at ourselves and being honest with, I'm broken before God. And on that cross, Jesus died so that we could be forgiven. I mean, at the cross, we receive this forgiveness and acceptance into God's family. Those people standing there with you at the cross, they're also now a part of God's family too. All of them sinners, all of them broken, no one better than the other, but now forgiven. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ. The gospel means 
that we're all equals at the cross. But the gospel doesn't end there. And for so many of you in your thinking, it might end there, and it doesn't. Some theologians have stated this, get this, they've said that Christianity is actually too cross-centric. <laughs> and I was offended by that when I first read that. What do you mean it's too cross-centric? Like the cross is too important? How could that be? What they've said is this, that if your version of the gospel stops at the cross, you've missed it. That your version of the gospel is too cross-centric, meaning this, it's missing the resurrection. The gospel means this, number two, in your notes, the gospel means that we are equals at the resurrection. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. So in Christ Jesus, if, if you're in Christ Jesus, you're at the cross, God, forgive me, you are given forgiveness and entrance into his family. In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither, oh, get this, please don't miss it, here it is. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. If you're a Jew in that first century and you're hearing this, he's saying, I'm erasing the lines that divide you. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, the social status lines, nor is there male and female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. By the way, in the first century, think about how radically revolutionary that is to say the value of men and the value of women. He's right-sizing that which has been wrong for so long. So as you gather in your church, from your diverse backgrounds, recognize that the gospel doesn't divide you into groups and value you differently by ethnicity, social status, or gender. It doesn't mean that you're all this weird sameness. <laughs> um, you're not just all the same now, and he doesn't erase um, the diversity that makes you distinct. He's just saying this, that you are valued in who you've been created to be. And not only at the cross is there equal ground, at the resurrection there's equal ground. And no one pulls away based on the lines that formerly separated you. For the church in Galatia, it was all about the Jews and Gentiles, right? Paul wrote directly to that. Listen, in chapter 5 verse 6 he writes, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. Whether you're Jew or Gentile... He says, I could care less. There's zero value in it. The only thing that counts, get this, get this, get this, is faith expressing itself through love. At the cross, we are forgiven and adopted into God's family. And at the resurrection, we're raised to new life where he says this, once your faith in Christ has come, now it's about expressing itself through love. And there's equality there. In this season of isolation, Many of us have felt how essential relationships are. I mean, good, healthy, God-honoring relationships. We've seen what happens when those relationships disappear and we return to some old habits, some old brokenness, some old ways that messed us up before. But the resurrection means that we're equals. All called to have this faith in Jesus and express love to each other regardless of the lines that our world draws between us. Listen, in chapters 1 through three of Galatians, Paul reiterates over and over and over again how the gospel unites us. Then in chapter uh, four, five, and six, he gets really practical about the unity of God's family. Because of this, I'm going to throw a third point in here. The gospel doesn't mean that we're just equals at the cross, or we're just equals at the resurrection. The gospel means this. We are united in building a multi-ethnic family. Here's how Paul writes about this. Galatians 5.13. You, my brothers and sisters. Think about that. He's writing it to Jews and Gentiles. He says, you're all my brothers and sisters. You were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. This is where it gets practical. I know indulge in the flesh Sounds so dirty, right? I mean, it just sounds wrong. So, how did you indulge in the flesh today? <laughs> uh, we don't talk about that, right? Um, it simply means this. There are things that you want. There are things that you crave. You want respect. You want recognition. You want comfort. You want safety. You want what's good for you. You want justice for you. Your focus is on, it's on you. 
if there was ever a descriptor for our culture today, it's this. We are focused on us, our opinions, and our rights. And I'm going to be very clear. That's not the gospel, and it's not the way of Jesus. How we love each other is actually formed by this gospel that says we're equals at the cross and we're equals at the resurrection. To humbly serve one another in love means this. We turn our energy and our attention to the needs of others, not our own. By the way, if you think that this is maybe a single isolated thing that Paul might have written in the letter to the Galatians, let me go on. Galatians 5.14, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping. 5.14, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Whatever you want for you, whatever it is that you're craving, that you desire, how you want to be loved, here's what you do. Ready? Don't just wish for it. I want you to actively go love people like that. I know some of you, you're trying to get through life flying under the radar, just trying not to be offensive to people. Here's the truth. That's not enough. We are to proactively approach our neighbor, particularly our neighbor who doesn't look like us, so that we can be on the mission of building God's multi-ethnic family. Again, Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit. See, this is the resurrection life. That you're given the Holy Spirit of God to transform you, and the result is this. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us stay in step with the Spirit, meaning it drives you to action. But then get this, don't miss this. This is how this closes. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Do you see how this life in God's family is turns outwards towards each other? The fruit of the Spirit can't be this, conceited. I'm better than my neighbor. The, the life on the, on the other side of the resurrection where God raises us to new life, I don't look down on anybody. It can't be provoking. <laughs> I'm not here to get under anybody's skin today. I'm not here to provoke in a negative way. And then it says this, if you're going to follow God, stay in step with, with Jesus, um, you can't be envying each other. Listen to this. This might speak to some of you right now. Envying is about seeing other people as better than you. Where you're sitting back and you're going, I, 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 just, I wish I had that, or I wish I was more like him, or I wish I was more like her. Stop. There's equality at the cross, and there's equality at the resurrection. I mean, this is so crazy good. Why are you looking at other people? giving them permission over your life, that unless they validate you, you don't feel worthy. Listen, the God of the universe, the one who sent his son to die for you, the all-powerful God, he validates your life. He did it when his son went to the cross for you. I'll be honest with you, and I hope you'll be honest with yourself. I've been pretty discouraged in our world. And I'm guessing that you've been pretty discouraged too. The amount of conflict we've had, the lack of understanding, the lack of listening, the absurdity of anger, frustration, fear, and anxiety, it is discouraging to me. If it's to you too, then I want you to hear this final thing that Paul wrote, and we'll end with this. Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to, here it is, all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Listen, I'm just going to be super honest with you. Our world will never get unity right. We won't. But the church should. This confrontation that Paul had where he calls out Peter, this was probably two decades after the resurrection. Listen to that, listen this is decades after the resurrection, the conflict in the church between Jews and Gentiles. It had raged for so long, become so discouraging. I bet they wondered this. Have we even made progress at all? They probably felt like we feel today. Let's not miss the obvious this morning. This entire letter was written to a church in a relational conflict. A church that was devouring each other because they didn't understand the gospel. They didn't understand that the gospel means we're all equals at the cross. We're all equals at the resurrection, and each are called to actively love one another, regardless of what the world chooses to divide us on. And that we are united on a mission together 
to build God's multi-ethnic family. Do you know where this came in? Before Martin Luther King Jr. ever had a dream, God had a dream. God had a dream that one day the gospel message of the cross and the resurrection would create a multi-ethnic family, and that multi-ethnic family would all have faith in his son, Jesus Christ, a family with a desire to live under his leadership, a family marked by actively loving one another, a family united in the mission of inviting the world into his united family. I would encourage you this week, again, wrestle with what Paul wrote. Read through the letter of Galatians. Download the notes. Read through these scriptures and ask yourself a couple of questions. Ask yourself if your understanding of the gospel has been too small and underdeveloped. And then do this. I want you to take a look at the opportunities that God's given you. And by opportunities, I mean people that God has placed in your life. And ask, how can you set their needs ahead of your own and express love to them? When we do that, we're, we're making progress. And we're taking steps as the body of Christ to love each other. Let's pray. Father, I would ask just in this moment that the, the things that are making us anxious in our relationships and the pains that, have, that are still hurting us today and the anger that we face, God, in this moment that you would take the gospel, the good news, and all the implications of it, and God, would you wash away the hurts some of you are sitting in your homes right now, you need to hear that. That God would wash away your hurt. God, I pray that you would give us courage and let us not give up loving each other. Some of you are sitting in your homes, you need to hear that. That God would give you courage to re-engage your relationships and love each other instead of sitting back waiting to be loved. God, give us that kind of encouragement today. Give that kind of courage and, and, and boldness to love each other well and God as we do I pray that our our discouraged world that the church would be a beacon of hope a place where people can finally come and see that there's a group of people getting it right God have mercy on us show us that ancient path of the gospel and how it heals us and helps us today and we pray this all in Jesus name amen